now on Zoom started, and I'm going to try to uh, do the access to the Facebook Live right now. Good luck. Okay, it seems to be working. That's good news. All right, and uh, town hall on COVID. One second. Okay, I'm going live on Facebook now. Okay, coming back to Zoom. Okay, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Paul Zeitz, and I'm the Executive Director of Build a Movement and the Co-Chair of the COVID-19 Emergency Response Group. I'm pleased to welcome you today to our town hall meeting on the COVID-19 and climate emergencies, protecting people from harm. The COVID-19 Emergency Response Group was formed in March 2020 to mobilize the people's voice to save as many lives as possible from the pandemic, ensure healthcare for all, and to ensure that our economic recovery creates jobs for a 21st century new energy economy that, and that protects us from the impacts of the climate emergency. We are committed to working together and mobilizing a collective United People's Coalition of Partners that can demand bold and transformative action and actually win legislative victories in Congress and in the broader political arena. Today's town hall is being broadcast live on Facebook at Build a Movement 2020 and by Politics Done Right on YouTube, Daily Cops, Op-Ed News, and Periscope. I'm pleased to introduce Mayor Jennifer Roberts, the former mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina, who is today's moderator. Thank you, Paul. And we know we're in the time of COVID, but one of the words on the New York Times crossword puzzle is unmute. <laughs> so I wanna take a minute and thank all the, our panelists for joining us today. We're very honored that you're taking the time out of your busy schedules for this important conversation with Americans from across our country. And I first want to express our deepest condolences to all of those who have lost loved ones during this pandemic. And I also want to acknowledge all those whose jobs put them in harm's way every day. Uh, our heroes, our healthcare workers and others who are saving lives and performing essential services to keep America's, Americans fed and safe. We are grateful and we honor you. I wanna bid welcome to the hundreds uh, who are listening to us on Facebook Live and on Zoom. Uh, this is being recorded and will be accessible later. And we, again, appreciate so much this timely information in this critical time in our nation's history. Since our time is limited and we have a number of speakers, I'm gonna get right to our program. And Senator Merkley, welcome. I see that you've joined us. Uh, you. Great. Um, protocol would dictate that I would start with you as a sitting US Senator, but I understand that Representative Talib has a vote on the floor and may have to be called away. So I'm wondering if you'd be so gracious to let her go first. Indeed, absolutely. <laughs> Super, and I'll introduce you uh, in a minute because um, we go back a long way. It's great to see you. So um, I'm gonna turn first to uh, US Representative Rashida Talib, who uh, represents the uh, Detroit area in Michigan. Uh, she is a distinguished member of the House of Representatives. It's the 10th Congressional District she has represented since 2019, filling a seat that was held for 40 years by Representative John Conyers. She has been a champion for Medicare for All. She has co-authored the, the Boost Act and has been a fierce advocate for clean water, as well as a moratorium on utility cutoffs and evictions. Uh, so important in this time. And um, Representative 
thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you with us. I am going to let you get started on what you've been working on so hard uh, and give us an update on the HEROES Act and what else uh, lies ahead to be done to protect Americans. Welcome. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Jennifer, and to everyone and, and Senator Merkley, who's been a wonderful partner in trying to make water a human right for all of us during this global pandemic. So I sincerely appreciate uh, this conversation, especially now as we are fighting on the House floor uh, to, to get this going, but also to really have a, um, a productive debate about what's in and what's not. Uh, I represent the 13th Congressional District, which is Detroit and a number of what we call Wayne County communities. And one of the things to know is, you know, I represent the third poorest congressional. So when I talk about some of these, you know, issues that you are on the ground fighting for, just know our community has felt uh, very much uh, directly what doing nothing looks like around our economic divide, environmental racism, uh, just the number of things that have really pushed more people, especially children, into poverty. And so for us, uh, it was very, very important uh, for my team and I and many of the community activists on the ground when the governor and others were asking people to wash their hands, we said, what about the ones who don't have water? Uh, when you're asking them to uh, do all the, the things of 10, days, 10 times a day to wash your hands, and you, right now you have thousands uh, of people across the country, not only uh, here in Detroit or in Flint or other communities where they've been completely cut off with water, some even as, as a, a number of years. Uh, and so we, we, we pushed for obviously a moratorium. And a moratorium, obviously, we, we support. And we are very much an, uh, uh, active on that, and, and, and it's in place. But know that a moratorium is temporary, y'all. Like, after this is done, what happens? Those bills, those uh, it's still going to be due. And so before that, the United Nations was right in, in Detroit talking about the lack of access to water and affordability and clean water when Flint became this national uh, crisis. So it was very important for us uh, to have something in the bill to basically address uh, uh, access to water. And so we have a $1.5 billion investment that's in the bill currently of creating a, kind of a direct payment to people. Uh, you know, a lot of folks have, uh, you know, different approaches, but we wanted to use the kind of approach that community action agencies use where it's like through LAHEAP, where we're actually dealing with the families one-on-one. -on -one. Because as Mary and Jean probably heard, especially in Michigan, it's not only just, hey, go over there and turn a knob and turn the water on, there's also infrastructure issues. You know, people need plumbing and also you gotta make sure that water is clean. And so we, again, have a requirement around moratorium, a national moratorium on water shutoffs, but a reconnection, this is a huge win for us, a reconnection requirement and the 1.5 billion, which we know will have to grow, uh, that it can't be just a one-time investment. The next thing is, you know, I, as we talk about our communities, um, you know, they're in survivor mode already before the pandemic. I mean, they were living check by check, as you all know. Uh, I think 40, I read somewhere, 40% of our neighbors across the country, uh, somebody in the household lost a job. And I believe many of that could be permanent, permanent job loss, not just, um, not just uh, you know temporarily because of the pandemic, we're seeing a really uh, a growing number of small businesses that are not bouncing back already. And 30 million plus people on unemployment, a third of our neighbors couldn't pay their rent in April. I don't know what the numbers are in, in May. So this is really crisis. And, and at the, on top of all that, uh, Jennifer, you centered us at the beginning. And I think it's really important in recognizing so much death. And, and loss for so many of our families, 80,000 plus, and it's growing. And so we want direct aid to people. We don't want the bureaucracy. So we want reoccurring payments. And that's why the Automatic Boost to Communities Act is critical. And we see bipartisan support for it. We've seen polling come out of bipartisan support outside of Congress in support of let's do $2,000 a month during this pandemic. And other countries are doing this. It helps people give them human dignity. You know, more terms again are the band-aid, but what happens afterwards? You know, and so the Automatic Boost to Communities Act is uh, aggressive, it's bold. It really does include every single person that lives among us, and it will save lives. You know, people need to be able to have some sort of consistency and some sort of support from us to have a partnership and saying that we got, we got you. You don't have to, you know, fight it through bureaucracy to get food assistance or food on the table. You don't have to, you know, be fighting with your landlord uh, because they're also struggling or whatever. You hear all these stories come out. And so we want to be able to, again, 
we've done it for corporations for so long, where we hand them out these big bailouts, no oversight. Uh, and I just don't know why we aren't doing a people's bailout and saying they deserve a reoccurring payment. Uh, and I know many of my folks, when they got the one-time payment, they paid off debt. They paid off debt that they had before, again, creating stability for many of our folks that, again, that are living in poverty. I leave with this. What I like in the bill, and this is really important for folks to know, just like people are been in survivor mode, our local governments have been. You know, so many of them have seen changes and shifts in taxes. And I'm telling you, they've lost so much and they're, they were in survivor mode. So now imagine with the pandemic, they are getting all of these PPs, ordering all the things that they need to save lives and, and, and watching also their firefighters and local law enforcement um, getting sick and, and dying uh, and, and wanting to expand testing at the local level. And to me, you know, when Federal Reserve Bank says banks are too big to fail, I say <laughs> local governments are too critical and too important to fail. Uh, and, and they really are, are, are that's, that's who contacts our, our residents have contact with, not the federal government, it is the local governments. And so we have, you know, a massive uh, aid for them. But what I love in there specifically, and I know I think Senator Berkeley supports this, is when we do FEMA reimbursements right now, it's 75% reimbursement rather than getting it to 100%. Again, we are dealing with a global pandemic. So if it's mass, if it's sites, you know, one of my counties is doing a spectacular thing and saying, hey, if you're a small business and you need a, or a loan to change the makeup of your business so that you can open up safely, uh, and they, they should be reimbursed for that, right? I mean, they, there should be a flexibility to pay hazard pay. So I just want to, you know, again, uh, urge all of us as we fight for, you know, from those that are my students to those that are fighting, you know, even the high cost of mortgages, they've been fighting for, again, all the different issues we had in our, in our country prior to. The way I think it's going to help people the most is the reoccurring payments, getting back to that. And, and again, FEMA, to me, reimbursements at 100% takes away the politics. You know these small communities, less than 20,000 people, they don't have the capacity to constantly be applying for various grants, competing with other communities and fighting for, for small dollars. But boy, if they're spending money to save lives during COVID, then they should be reimbursed for that. Um, and so I will leave you with all that. And I, I would be remiss and, and my Congressional Progressive Caucus would be upset if I didn't mention uh, what's not in the bill and, and it's something that I'm really disappointed to not see there, especially with 30 million of our neighbors are unemployed is the paycheck guarantee program. Uh, this is something that we need to continue fighting. No people are starting to more and more talk about this, uh, but this is, we've never seen unemployment numbers like this since the great depression. We have to be creative. And, and you know, when we again, think about how do we stop the spread? How do we make sure? It is also that economic stability. It is so key, y'all, to making sure that people uh, can stay home, that they can be safe, that they're not putting their lives at risk. Uh, and so, uh, again, thank you all so much, uh, especially for my, you know, 100 plus organizations that have signed on to make water a human right and supported our efforts in the House. We would never have been able to get this far in getting it in the final bill language uh, that I'm hoping to be able to vote for today. Thank you so much, uh, Representative. That is a, a terrific summary of all you've been fighting for and working for on behalf of the American people. And um, we wish you the best in the votes today on the, on the House floor and hope that you get support and continue to work for all the people. We have been watching what's been going on with, of course, water issues in Detroit and Flint. Uh, and even here in North Carolina, after climate impacts, we've had local water systems that get inundated in flooding and have a very difficult time repairing. And so uh, water is an issue that everyone needs to care about. And you're singing um, all the, the US Conference of Mayors and all the National League of Cities folks who uh, talk about how much local governments do are thanking you right now <laughs> because you were singing our song about how at the local level, uh, cities can't run deficits, but they are responsible for public health and public safety where the rubber meets the road. And so we really, really appreciate you emphasizing that and recognizing that. So thank you uh, on behalf of all our local officials. Um, I don't know if you have time for one question, but um, we do need to get to Senator Merkley. Okay, because he's, uh, he's also on a short time frame. Um, but uh, just a real quick question, Representative, what are your 
uh, thoughts about your support in Congress for, for what you're pushing for? I mean, what I, I see is, you know, overwhelming growing support, primarily because 15 million people are suffering from source order water shutoff. So this is not just an issue in my district. What we did, my team and I, we actually pulled up the congressional districts that have water shutoffs and went to the members because it may not be as an aggressive issue or a big issue like it is in my district. I mean, it's something we talk about at all different levels of government. It's been an issue prior to the pandemic, but I can tell you a lot of my colleagues said, yeah, I've heard about that, but they may not have uh, realized that so many of their residents that they support don't have access. I mean, we talked to a woman in Tennessee that hadn't had access to water for four years. Uh, it was really sad to hear uh, just what she has to do, you know, I mean, we were all in tears by the time we were done speaking to her about how, you know, she's so tired of having to go to her son's house to take a bath and being a burden on him. And, and she wants to pay, but she doesn't, can't pay so much, but she'll pay. She's like, I'll pay what I have. I promise I just need water. Uh, and so uh, I think seeing a much more growing support and unfortunately it took a pandemic uh, because water is a human right, something I've been working on prior to the pandemic, but it took a pandemic and, and what's happening for people to realize, just like we're fighting for testing, we're fighting for masks, we're fighting for gowns, we're fighting for swabs. We also need to make sure that we're fighting for access to water, which is very much preventing the spread of COVID. Uh, so I, I, again, there are still so many things, uh, as you all know, being the third poorest, not having reoccurring payments and not having the paycheck guarantee and even some of the stuff around pensions and labor are really troubling still for me. Uh, and so just know this, you all, like these are small wins, but is it sustainable, right? When does that 1.5 billion run out? When does that one-time payment they have in year of 1,200? Our folks already spent it. I know this. When it comes in, they're already going to spend it on things that they couldn't afford before. Again, when I tell you a significant portion of our folks couldn't afford their mortgage. They had a forbearance, student loans. I mean, everybody is impacted by this. So we need direct aid and reoccurring payments does that. And again, for all you all thinking Republic, this is honestly a nonpartisan issue outside of Congress. People on the ground support it. They want direct aid. This is their tax dollars. And they're saying, yeah, give it to us. We know what we need to spend it on. We know what we are needs it. It's our water bills, our utility bills, our mortgage, our student loans groceries. If it's even some person told me, I still have medical debt, Rashida, like even just having to be able to, to, to again, use it for things that I feel in many ways create the stability that we need. And it stimulates local economy. I, I Jennifer, you know, economists out there, they say, hey, you bail out corporations, they hoard it. But boy, you give money to people, they'll spend it and, and they'll spend it in their local establishment and small businesses. And that's what we need to support. Thank you so much, Representative. We really appreciate your time. And uh, you have hit on so many of the topics that, um, that we've been feeling uh, down in the communities in America. Um, I want to, and I know we have another speaker whose time is limited. So now it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome uh, US Senator Jeff Merkley. Uh, it is great to see you. He is a distinguished US Senator from Oregon who's been in office since 2009. He has been a longtime leader on climate change and transitioning to 100% clean renewable energy. Uh, he's also fighting against fossil fuel bailouts and the Rewind Act and subsidies. And his efforts have helped Oregon be a leader in climate action as well. But he's also been on the forefront of fighting for the rights of uh, Americans to be safe, to stay in their homes, to not have their utilities uh, cut off, to have unemployment benefits, and has worked really hard to help impacted communities and more in confronting this pandemic. Uh, he has really been a leader and co-signatory on so many of the important pieces of legislation that are protecting us and helping us get through this economic crisis as well as health crisis. But I have to say one more thing, and that is that Senator Merkley and I are friends from way back. We served on a national board together for the World Affairs Councils of America. And even when he was a representative at the state level uh, in Oregon, he um, has a tremendous uh, intellect and ability to see the big picture, to draw connections, connect the dots and resolve problems. Uh, he is a great problem solver and I'm pleased to call him my friend. And I wanna welcome you, Senator, to this discussion. I'm gonna let you talk about what you've been working on and um, help us know how we can help you succeed. Thanks for joining us.
I think you're on okay, mute. Unmuted. There we go. Uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining the call, and thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction. And it was a pleasure to work with you on that national board so many years ago, and to be in contact through your time as mayor and county commissioner, and fighting so many important fights, including the fight on climate. I thought I would just uh, start by noting how phenomenal this time is. Could we ever have imagined? Uh, we start with the dark and dangerous times associated with, from my viewpoint, what is an incompetent executive branch uh, that has put us at risk time and time again before this crisis. And then you throw in the pandemic, and then you throw in the economic implosion, and it's just like reading an Armageddon novel. And we go, we wake up, we go, is this really all happening right now? And, uh, and it is, which is why these types of calls and communication are so important as we try to find our way through this uncharted territory. The bill that uh, Rashida was so instrumental in working on in the, in the House it has a lot of good things in it. And uh, you think about the fundamentals for family, you have food, you have shelter, you have utilities. And let me just start there and note that that bill has a 15% increase in SNAP benefits, very important. My state of Oregon is one of the hungriest in the nation, really important. On shelter, it has a hundred billion for rental assistance so people can help make their rent payments and 75 billion to help people make their mortgage payments so that they don't end up in foreclosure. So it's fighting eviction, it's fighting foreclosure. And then turning to utilities, which aren't thought about so much, and it was really a pleasure to, to partner with Rashida, and she emphasized the role of water. The, the House bill takes a even broader viewpoint of water, electricity, and broadband. And think about how essential broadband is if you're looking for work, if you're trying to communicate with friends and stay in touch, if you're a student uh, who is now having to go to school over broadband. And, it highlights the enormous inequities we have in our country. Uh, families are not all the same, uh, even before you get to the issue of affluence. Uh, so there's structure in some families that will help students study. Uh, there is less structure in others. There are funds in some families that mean that they have broadband uh, and uh, they have the equipment, others don't. So in that bill is a fund for connectivity that will help folks who have the availability of broadband but can't afford it, get connected with the equipment, the initial setup, and then paying monthly fees through September 2021. So to the house, really well done on those essential utility connections. And that a broader coalition on uh, moratorium on utility shutoffs, more than 800 groups. It's one of the largest uh, grassroots assemblages I've, I've, I've ever seen. So that is terrific. Uh, testing and tracing to, to take us out of this nightmare of foundation on the healthcare side. A lot of support uh, for that. Our state and local governments, uh, 500 billion for our state governments and 350 billion for our local governments and support for tribes and support uh, for territories. So this shouldn't be an issue at all because normally my Republican colleagues are saying, well, any government that's closer to the people is one we should support and state government is closer than the federal government. But we have Mitch McConnell over here leading the Senate saying, you know what, we'll just let the states go bankrupt. And it's like, where is that coming from? And part of it seems to be an effort to reinforce the argument that government is the enemy, so why support them, let them go bankrupt. Uh, I think in the end though, I think it's more about bargaining. Bargaining over getting help for the mega corporations in order while we're fighting for help for state and local government. And that's really disturbing uh, because there is this make the rich richer, make the powerful more powerful theme to the way that the, my colleagues across the aisle have been acting, including in the last bill, Corona 3.5, talking at the last second uh, by the chair of the finance committee, which is the tax committee, and by the majority leader was 175 billions and more tax cuts for the richest Americans. Mm -hmm. So, Let's get that 175 billion back. And guess what? In the House bill, they get it back. Uh, so that is, that is great. And that's the same amount they're spending on uh, fighting foreclosures and, um, and evictions on the housing side. So that's a good movement of that 175 billion from a place it isn't needed to a place it's desperately, desperately needed. 
I wanted to mention two things that are not in the House bill that I'm very concerned about. One is a guaranteed access to an absentee ballot in November. And that access should exist for everyone. Oregon has had vote by mail forever, and there is a bill for full vote by mail uh, that Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota and Ron Wyden from my state are championing, and I'm partnering with them, but they are the leads. And uh, I have a backup plan that is much simpler plan that says every state has an absentee ballot program. Open that up in this coming November election to anyone who wants an absentee ballot. A no excuse absentee ballot program. The infrastructure is already there. It can be amplified. We can provide financial assistance to, to amplify it. But nobody should have to worry about going to the polls and getting an infection this, this coming November. It is part of a broader philosophical battle. We have seen since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act uh, that one party has said, well, let's pursue all kinds of voter suppression and voter intimidation tactics because there's people we don't want to vote. We don't want college students to vote. We don't want poor people to vote. We don't want communities of color to vote. Uh, and uh, that philosophy is so at odds with the view of government of, by, and for the people. Uh, but if you're powerful, you don't want those groups voting. And so we've got this whole voter suppression movement. And the last thing they want is to make it easier for people to cast a ballot. So this issue over, over being able to vote safely in November is part of a bigger battle, not just over voting access, uh, but over the issue of gerrymandering and over the issue of dark money in politics. And there is a bill that uh, is in the House that passed the House called HR1. It's for the People Act. And it takes on gerrymandering and voter suppression and dark money and ethics. Here in the Senate, uh, Tom Udall of New Mexico is the pilot. I'm the co-pilot on it. Tom's retiring. So I'm, I'm using every possible form to say, hear those words for the people and think about how is the Senate going to pass that act to try to restore, take on, take on the corruption that's inhabiting our electoral system. Because if we don't take on that corruption, we're going to lose on health care, housing, education, living waste jobs, Equality Act, taking on climate crisis and other environmental issues. Uh, so it's kind of the foundation. It's the first thing we should do in January 2021 if we have a majority that is ready to take on the, uh, the rigged system. We have to unrig it the moment we have an opportunity to do so. Uh, the second thing that's not in the, the House bill uh, is the Rewind Act. Uh, an effort to say this crisis should not be used as a moment to give more subsidies to the fossil fuel world. Instead, we should be driving a transition to renewable energy. This year, uh, yesterday was announced that this year is the first year that the energy from renewable energy, uh, specifically hydro, wind, and solar being the big versions of that, will exceed the energy electricity generated by coal. So coal is no longer king. And uh, part of that is the environmental consciousness over climate. And part of it is the blessing that solar and wind have become cheaper than fossil fuels. And we have to really be aware of the fact that natural gas is not a solution to climate, that it produces a lot of methane leakage that does as much damage to the climate as coal does. So we've got a long ways to go. Anyway, so that's the, that's the big vision. I hope we can find a way to push on this issue of transition, using these massive resources we're investing now to transition rather than to anchor, anchor ourselves in the fossil fuel world. And so with that, let me turn it back over to, uh, to Jennifer and the team. Terrific, Senator. Uh, I could hear you, I could listen to you talk forever because you're hitting such important points, connecting voting to the policies we'll have going forward. Uh, the census, it's a census year, really important. Uh, and also the climate issue, which is our long-term crisis, uh, which is gonna be with us for a long time. You've done so much there. Uh, I have two quick questions for you if you have time. Um, one is how do we continue to push for that green stimulus in the time of COVID in a way that still recognizes people are really suffering now? Uh, how do we continue that? And second, how can we help you? We've got people on this call from all over the country. Uh, are there key senators? Are there key votes? How can we help you get these things passed? Well, let's, let's start uh, by saying it would be so helpful for everyone on this call and every group you all represent to express 
uh, concern with the House members over these two issues of voting access. Yes, there's funds to help states change their voting systems, but specifically ask for a no excuse absentee ballot program for November. That's what we, we, we need uh, at a minimum. And uh, second of all, express dissatisfaction that we didn't put in the House bill a blockade on funding to fossil fuel companies. By the way, uh, the fossil fuel world is trying to get even more help. They're trying to create a virtual strategic petroleum reserve in which not only does, do we have this physical reserve, but they want to say, well, the government can now buy oil from companies while it's still in the ground. They would just give them money, what's never been pumped, and as a way of direct subsidy of the, of the oil industry. And that's just crazy. And there should at least be in the House bill uh, a measure limiting the strategic reserve uh, to the actual physical strategic reserve. And then another strategy that uh, the fossil fuel companies are at right now is to try to enable the banks to get waivers to take over fracking companies that are going bankrupt, keep them alive, and then pump new life into them when the, when the value goes up in the future. We should be a block on that waiver. Just those two things would at least be a symbolic acknowledgement uh, that this is an issue that's unacceptable. And neither one of those would take on the fact that there's a $4 trillion lending slush fund that's being used in an incredible way to transfer uh, financial support to the fossil fuel world. I'd like to see the blockade on that as well. That may be too far for the House to go. They, they may not be able to at least get the first two done. Uh, so those two issues, voting, guaranteed absentee ballot, and at least a limit on this uh, gambit of the, the banks and the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, uh, I feel a lot better about what the House is doing. Super. Well, we, um, we all have our homework cut out for us, that's for sure. Um, I also want to add one more thing. I'm really glad that you're including universal internet access as one of those basic human rights, because if we've seen during any, any crisis, the pan this pandemic shows how important internet access is. And we have so many areas, rural areas and urban areas that don't have access. And so many families that are cut off, um, distance learning, all those kids. Uh, from lower income families who can't, who can't uh, afford it. So thank you so much for that. We, we really appreciate it. You're very welcome. It's, and it's, it just this highlights how in, essential it is. Uh, it's as essential as electricity uh, in this uh, day and age. And, and uh, it's in the Senate, I was able to drive a, three years ago, an 11-fold increase in the support for funding to build out broadband in rural communities. And the administration is sitting on about $700 million of that that they have not distributed. Uh, and it's just like, why? Why? It's been appropriated. Uh, everyone on every side of the aisle says help rural communities have broadband. Every family should have access. But uh, where there is broadband available, I am really pleased. I want to emphasize that with the House and having this uh, substantial fund to enable people to connect who can't afford to connect right now. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to Rashida, even though she's not on the call. Uh, she's been a great partner on this moratorium um, uh, on cutoffs and so much else. Uh, so bringing a very passionate, and she's just direct, you know, I live in a blue collar community and um, you can tell members of Congress who don't live in fancy places with gates, uh, <laughs> who are surrounded by other people who are in the upper tier. I mean, we think about the unemployment we're talking about, well over 30 million people, another 3 million this last, last week, and yet 40% of people earning less than $40,000. So if you're in a blue collar community, it's like every other house is experiencing unemployment and just everyone's terrified that they're, they're next. And many who haven't hit the unemployed have hit the, I'm sorry, your shifts have been reduced from five to one. So there's a huge amount of that as, as well, again, hitting low income uh, Americans. So, okay, much to do. Thank, Thank you. you all for being in the battle. We've got to reclaim our country. The system has become so rigged by and for the powerful that you, it's almost unrecognizable from the Congress that I saw a few decades ago. And uh, it's, it's the moment. We have to have a mass movement to reclaim it. Thank you, everyone, and take care.
Thank you, Senator. You're so inspiring. And uh, we hope that you keep fighting for the people for a long time to come. We really appreciate you. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay, take care. Wow. Um, amazing work going on at the federal level, and uh, we are inspired that there are people who are willing to, uh, to keep that fight going and to recognize what it's like for families every day um, trying to make their way through this pandemic and with a hurricane season and climate challenges coming uh, in the middle of this. Um, I'm going to start on, um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. And I'm going to start in something that the Senator mentioned about voting rights. So um, let me first introduce uh, John Autry, who is a member of the North Carolina General Assembly of uh, the House of Representatives. And he was elected in 2016, formerly served on the Charlotte City Council. Uh, he has been a leader on clean renewable energy, uh, also on issues of social justice, many of the issues that we heard our first two speakers uh, talk about. and. The states have a great deal of power in this recovery. Uh, one of the issues mentioned uh, was the voting um, and North Con has had its uh, share of issues around election fraud and other challenges, uh, reduced hours, closing of polls, et cetera. And so um, Representative Autry, uh, we, we want you to talk about COVID as well. Can you start with talking about where things stand? I know that the House uh, and Senator uh, for North Carolina are getting ready to reconvene next week. So I'd love to hear an update and welcome. Thank you so much. Sure, Jennifer, thank you all so much. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, uh, I, I, I would say that, you know, voting in North Carolina uh, is usually a contact sport. And uh, I look forward to uh, not necessarily having it face-to-face uh, -face this year, but uh, that remains to be seen how that's gonna play out. So we're all in, in the Democratic House Caucus, we're very concerned about the uh, opportunities that are gonna be presented to the citizens of North Carolina for voting this year and what we might do about it. Uh, there are negotiations still underway. Uh, we, the, the speaker in the House uh, set up a, uh, uh, a COVID-19 response select committee and created four subcommittees from that. And one of those was uh, continuity of governmental operations and services. And so it, the voting of for in the 2020 cycle certainly was a piece of that discussion. And I think where it is right at this point is that uh, there's going to be a bill that will be introduced and uh, the short session in North Carolina, the filing deadline for bills was yesterday afternoon at four o'clock. So the last few days have been like, you know, everybody's hair is on fire to get these things done. Uh, the filing closed at four yesterday. Uh, folks are now uh, seeking, you know, all the other support that they're going to need to do this. In North Carolina, election laws are not subject to any deadlines. So work continues on a bill to come forward dealing with the election in 2020. And uh, basically the only thing that I can say that has been agreed upon at this point is that for whatever comes out of those negotiations, the Democratic caucus will not be filing their own bill to stake their own flag into the ground for this. So um, that helps me to understand that there's going to be some very sensitive negotiations going forward of which I am not a part of, but we certainly get updates whenever we have caucus meetings. Um, so if I can move on now to the, the things that we've been working on here uh, in the last week or two is uh, getting some bills together and garnering support for those. And of course, uh, as far as environmental law goes, uh, we, uh, Representative Harrison, Butler, and myself filed a bill called uh, House Bill 1109, which is to ban the manufacture, use, and distribution of PFAS and PFAS containing chemicals and products. Uh, we have uh, serious, very serious uh, issues in North Carolina around permanent chemicals uh, getting into our groundwater and uh, we know that the concentration levels in the Cape Fear River, once you get south of uh, uh, Cumberland County, which is where I am from, uh, but uh, the, there, 
you know, that DuPont plant that was down there on the river has been there for 50, 60 years. And uh, they were compelled by the courts to clean it up. And their response after waiting to the final moment was, hey, it's going to be too expensive for us to clean it up. We can't do it. So uh, DEQ is uh, getting ready to do some other, uh, take on some other actions to compel them to step up and, and be responsible corporate citizens. Um, it, it just confounds me all the time that if corporations are people, based on the railroad and the Santa Barbara County case from the latter part of the 19th century, which gave corporations the rights of a, of, of a legal person, then uh, if we have to be responsible for the bad things that we may do, why shouldn't our corporate citizens be compelled to do the same thing? So uh, it's very frustrating, very aggravating. And unfortunately, we have a Republican controlled legislature. And uh, so it's, it's probably gonna be look great on paper, but uh, once it's filed and introduced, that'll probably be the last time we ever see anything about it. Uh, the other things that I've been working on, uh, let's see, uh, we have a, a bill about uh, frontline workers uh, that uh, uh, Representative Harrison and Fisher and Representative Hunt and I filed that is uh, to mandating hazard pay for mandatory state employees on the front line fighting communicable disease uh, associated with the pandemic and the purpose in directing the Legislative Research Commission that is going to study what hazard pay best practices <clears throat> for these folks because uh, we want it to be known that through the uh, course of their work, if they get sick with this disease, the presumption is they got it while they were on work. And this is a way to uh, uh, make sure that we're uh, maintaining the health of our people and providing them with the equipment and things that they need to be safe. Uh, the uh, next thing I need to talk about is unemployment insurance. Good Lord, North Carolina has probably the worst unemployment insurance system that anybody could ever conceive. It, if, if you really start digging into the minutia of the way the system doesn't work, you really understand that the uh, uh, people who designed and redeveloped the system in 2013, it is a direct reflection of their animus that such a system even exists. Because we're the slowest pay, one of the slowest paying states, the maximum benefit is $350 a week. And the time that you can collect that benefit is only 12 weeks. So it, it, it really, and we've got like, $3.7 billion in the unemployment uh, trust fund currently. Uh, but, you know, they're pretty stingy. Well, they're just going to find some way to give it out away in school vouchers or some other firm uh, for that money. But uh, it, I filed a bill that deals with uh, a lot of the issues that I've been uh, faced with from uh, my former colleagues in the film and television industry who uh, earn income in multiple states. Uh, that has created a major problem of getting them approved for benefits and uh, even getting into the system. And sometimes I actually had somebody in DES in the last couple of weeks say to me, well, maybe they should file for benefits in South Carolina. But I don't know how you do that if you're not a resident of South Carolina. So uh, I filed a bill to uh, address that and direct the department to use its maximum flexibility to determine the eligibility of those sections of individuals employed in industries that are require them to work in North Carolina and other states during the benefit year. That's just plain and simple stuff. They're paying taxes in North Carolina. They're residents of North Carolina. They grew, and a lot of them are native North Carolinians. They should have access to the system and the benefits that they're entitled to whenever they lose their ability to earn a living from no fault of their own. Uh, another bill that I filed deals with um, um, foreclosure. <laughs> uh, it's provided, uh, 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 we, we still have like $2 billion of unappropriated CARES Act money in North Carolina. 
So I've asked for an appropriation of $100 million to uh, deal with the potential of foreclosures. Our courts, of the governor and the chief justice of the state Supreme Court, their actions have basically closed down our courts uh, during the, this pandemic. And uh, we expect that they'll probably want to start ginning up again in, in June. But uh, I understand from discussions with our district attorney, we can't expect any sort of trials before July. But I anticipate as soon as the courts open, we'll have a line of attorneys around the courthouse waiting to get in and file uh, foreclosure and eviction notices. Uh, so we're trying to come up with some ways and mechanisms that we can uh, uh, offset this. Uh, in North Carolina, we have uh, an agency called the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency, and they have a mechanism in place called the Home Protection Program. But obviously, in the last year, uh, due to what didn't happen in a budget, uh, they lost all their funding last July. So the uh, office, uh, the staff has been laid off last year. The office space was relinquished, and we expect that uh, if we can get this bill uh, uh, through the legislature, that it'll take them about 60 days to spin it up again. And uh, that gives us enough time when the courts, everybody starts coming into the court to filing these, uh, uh, th these requests, that uh, that'll give them enough time to uh, gin up the system, restaff the uh, department, and uh, start pushing these monies off. Now, this money goes to the mortgage holder, not to the uh, uh, homeowner. And uh, it, it, it's, we're still waiting on information from the U.S. Treasury about whether we can do it as a loan or whether it has to be a grant. And that conundrum is just really, really frustrating to try to find our way through how that may or may not work. The uh, last bill that I filed yesterday uh, deals with uh, evictions and utility payments. This also appropriates $100 million of the unappropriated uh, money from CARES Act to uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, who has a housing assistance program set up as a department of uh, uh, their housing security. So that would take that $100 million and help pay people's rents and their utilities bills once they are compelled to go back to work and to, uh, because the last thing we need is people losing their home in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, it's enough that we have to deal with all the other uh, in, in <laughs> intrusions on our normal lifestyles, but then to be facing with the, uh, the prospects of losing your home, losing your housing, it, it just, it just, I mean, I can't imagine how terrible that would be for us. But uh, so we're, uh, the, our caucus is very unified in these efforts. Uh, we've had some very productive discussions with uh, some of the leadership in the legislature. Um, whatever may end up actually being passed at some point in the future will very likely not have as many Democratic names on it as it does today, but that doesn't matter to me. As long as we get the job done and we are protecting people from losing their housing that's fine. I don't need my name on that legislation. I just want to see the dial moving. So I've, uh, I've rambled on enough. And I thank you very much for this opportunity, all of you. And it's really an honor to be on the, uh, the same platform with you folks today. And uh, I'll just uh, shut up now. Thank you. Well, Representative Autry, I wonder if you can um, just answer a couple questions before you uh, before you go that is truly informative. And I think for our national listeners to see the challenge at the state level in dealing with uh, some of the money that's come to the federal government, the restrictions on that, the inability to spend it um, as intended, and then the responsibility of state and local governments to then vote on how to direct that. And um, uh, the question I have for you is, um, with the uh, majority that we have in our House and Senate at the state level, what do you think the, possibility, the possibilities are of those things that you're putting forward? Is there bipartisan support to really help people stay in their homes, to help prevent water shutoffs? Um, wh what, is, uh, what is your sense of that at this point? Well, we, we're fortunate in that way. <clears throat> we have a lot of uh, 
real estate brokers in the uh, Republican caucus. We have a uh, one who is actually a mortgage broker, has his own mortgage company, and uh, have lived through the Great Recession and seen what it means when a housing market completely collapses. So there is interest. Uh, what that final mechanism may be, I don't know. And, and I kept pushing and pushing and pushing with the economic support subcommittee, which is the, the subcommittee that I was a member of on the COVID-19 response committee, was to that I kept raising this issue up with leadership. And it, yeah, yeah, well, why don't you send me an email and we'll start out of the thread and we'll, but it, it, it didn't happen. So uh, I went ahead and uh, had a bill drafted work with the NCHFA, the uh, DHHS, uh, housing advocates, folks at the Budget and Tax Center here in North Carolina, the North Carolina Justice Center. And I think we crafted a really nice and effective bill that touches all the bases, gets the money into the, to, to the uh, uh, people's hands that are going to uh, make it possible for people to stay in their homes. And uh, that, in itself, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about sticking the flag in the ground. That sticks the flag in the ground. And where we go and what directions we have to move from that to get something else done is just going to be diminishing a little piece of it, a little piece of it. And that in itself is going to have, uh, a, a, it'll create talking points for folks in the coming months. Yeah. Thank you, Representative. And um, I hope that you can stay on the line. We're going to um, hear for a couple more. A couple more speakers. I know some people can only stay on for an hour. So, um, but we'd love to have you uh, stay on here uh, about some of the issues on water because the uh, next two folks have been doing a lot uh, around those uh, important issues, um, biological diversity and food and water watch. So if you can hang in there, that'd be awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I am next going to turn to Jen Su, um, who is uh, with us uh, with the Center for Biological Diversity, uh, which as a climate champion, I'm really glad for the work that you all are doing, absolutely. And she is the energy director uh, of the Climate Law Institute at, at the center. She focuses on transforming legal structures of the US power sector to achieve rapid increases in renewable and clean energy, to phase out fossil fuels, and to support electrification of transportation. Um, she helped get organizations to sign a letter urging the House and Senate to implement a moratorium on utility cutoffs. And um, that's part of the HEROES Act and she's been a great advocate. Uh, and we look forward to, to hearing your update. Um, I'm gonna also introduce Mary Grant real quick and then um, let you all, um, let her go right after you. Uh, Mary Grant is with us with Food and Water Watch. She's the public uh, Water for All campaign director and she oversees campaigns that support universal access to safe water in the United States by promoting responsible and affordable public provision of water and sewer services. Uh, she's a policy analyst on the US utility privatization. And those of us in North Carolina who uh, work with Duke Energy and its monopoly um, are interested to hear, um, there was also a question in the chat about how we can support more microgrids and how we can uh, work against um, some of these monopolies. Microgrids actually are very resilient. Um, and so there's uh, a, great, a great question there. So uh, Jen Su, I'll start with you. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Great, and, and thanks for having me. Um, I think Mary and I will actually tag team with each other because uh, we're, we're, we're a duo uh, among other key coalition groups in this effort. Um, so, so we'll just talk together if that's all right for everyone. Um, just a big, big thank you to everyone for organizing this call and Mayor Roberts, I'm such a huge um, fan of yours. Um, and Representative Autry, uh, we have been working kind of indirectly with you on monopoly issues uh, with Duke in North Carolina. So thank you for being a constant champion, uh, both of you on climate um, and, and for people. So uh, I'll just give a little bit of a background about where we are right now in the HEROES Act. I think we've heard from you know, Senator Merkley and, and Representative Tlaib how critical this issue is right now. Um, and I, I, I want to just flesh that out with a couple of numbers for folks to really understand you know, what is going on. So right now, without any legislation that's been passed on this, we have 40% of the population in the US that has no protections on water shutoffs, and Mary can talk about that further. We have, by the end of this month, 
80% of states will have no protections against power shutoffs in this country. And broadband, as we all know, is a corporate uh, behemoth, and they have you know, talked about voluntary moratoria that they have repeatedly reneged on. So we are in a situation where people are basically being denied their human rights in this crisis, which is unacceptable normally, but, but to exploit it in this moment is even more devastating. So just wanted to ground us um, in that reality. So, you know, in response to all of that, um, Mary's organization, Food and Water Watch, my organization, Center for Biological Diversity, four other organizations um, as well, I uh, rounded up um, 830 organizations that basically ranged from, you know, not only water rights folks and electricity folks and broadband folks, but human rights groups, climate groups, um, civil rights groups, because this is an issue that should not be partisan. Um, and it is ridiculous that a Republican would vote against giving basic human rights and making this a partisan issue. Uh, so with that, you know, we, we rounded it out and, um, and sent it up uh, to the Senate and the House um, and, and basically asked for this type of support. And in response, Senator Merkley, who is no longer here, took that up completely and had pioneered this idea of getting this nationwide moratorium into the bills. Um, Rashida Tlaib introduced a water act uh, and um, Representative, uh, Representative Pallone um, and DeFazio have also been leaders in this as well as Sherrod Brown in the Senate. So um, that's, that's where we are. The incredible news about all of this and um, you know, just both the Senate and House support is that the HEROES Act actually has um, in place right now uh, provisions that would enact a nationwide moratorium on utilities. And when I say utilities, we're not only talking about water and power here for Mary and I, but also broadband and also um, other essential utilities like wastewater. It is basically securing human rights for everybody during this period. Um, and the moratorium language is also strong because uh, it actually grants a grace period. So once President Trump lifts this emergency, how are people going to bounce back like that? This moratorium actually has an incredible grace period of four months to get people back on their feet so that they can recover, not only recover from the sickness, but the unemployment, and just overall get out of their debt as Representative Tlaib was talking about before. So those are key aspects of this moratorium. We were really just um, so thankful for Speaker Pelosi, Senator Schumer has also come out in support of this. Um, and, and those two have been leading the charge of, of keeping this in the bill. Um, where we are right now is, you know, today the House is going to vote on it. We, we hope um, that they will absolutely vote for this and not take this out. And then the next step is going to be to the Senate, which Mary and I can talk about in a moment, about how we're actually going to hit that huge, huge war in front of us on a nonpartisan issue that is becoming partisan. Mary? So before, do we need everybody to start calling their, their representatives in the House right now to vote for this? Absolutely. <laughs> send an email while you're listening, right? Yeah. Keep listening, but send an email to your representatives. Okay, go ahead, Mary. <laughs> no, it's amazing that the, the House bill actually contains three places that impose a, a moratorium on water shutoffs. Having water um, right now is so important to prevent the spread of disease. It's always an injustice, always an injustice to shut someone off because they can't afford their water bill. And so there's been a groundswell of movement at the local level, like states like North Carolina have imposed a statewide moratorium on water utility shutoffs, one of the first to do it and to require reporting on it, which was so important. States like Michigan have done it. Um, but we really need a nationwide moratorium on water shutoffs. More than one in three people have never been protected from a water shutoff during this pandemic. And we've heard from people in 10 states across the country that have experienced water shutoffs during this crisis. They can't wash their hands, they can't clean, they can't protect themselves and their families. So it's so important that everyone has running water at home, especially now as we fight this really, really frightening disease. Um, so that the HEROES Act does include a national moratorium in three places for water. It includes provisions very similar to Representative Tlaib's Emergency Water is a Human Right Act, which suspends shutoffs. It requires restorations, which is so important for people who've already been disconnected. And it waives late fees on water bills. 
So this is an incredible work and a testament to all the groups around the country who've been working for years to make sure that people recognize water as a basic human right and have been fighting on the ground to make sure people have running water. Um, and we want to thank all the people who have already called and urge you to call to the House of Voting we here um, tonight from 5 to 8 p.m. sometimes. So really, this is your last minute. Call your representative and tell them to fight not only right now to, for, to, um, to pass this water shutoff moratorium and utility shutoff moratorium, but also to make sure that they um, urge leadership to fight for it in the final bill, that we need to pass a final bill that includes a water shutoff moratorium. So to both of your uh, organizations, I'm, a, I'm an activist at heart. So to both of your organizations have uh, on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram ways that people can post and repost and share um, the need to do this because now that we're in COVID, that's how we get information out. And we, we do it all the time with social media. But um, do you have those and do you want to give your Twitter signs or, or Facebook pages real quick? Sure. You can visit us at Food and Water, at Food and Water um, on Twitter and um, we have definitely um, a lot of social media images. I also want to urge people to call 202-609-9041. If you call that, we'll give you instructions um, about how to urge your representative to fight for a water and utility shutoff moratorium. And it'll also then connect you directly with um, the congressional switchboard. So you can talk to your office directly, your, the office of your representative directly. So that's 202-609-9041. So take out your phones, type it in, 202 609-9041. And at the end of this panel, call them, hit send, and talk to them and tell them that you want them to fight to pass a national moratorium on utility shutoffs. Terrific. And uh, Jen, so you're muted. Do you want to give us your Center for Biological Diversity? You've got a Twitter sign too. Um, sure. I, I just love our um, dead set call in number uh, cheerleading here. Um, <laughs> Uh, so my handle is uh, A Jean Su, A J E A N S U, um, and Mary and I and, and all of our colleagues um, are tweeting this out constantly. Uh, we hosted an earlier day of action this week, but really it is a week of action. Um, so please call, and I'm just going to say it one more time for people: two zero two six zero nine nine zero four one. It actually works, everyone, um, to call and to show that you care and that you need this nationwide moratorium. So please do it. Every single thing counts. And then yeah. urge your neighbors, urge your networks, urge your friends and your family to take action and call too. Calling is the most important way that you can urge your representative to take action on this issue. That's absolutely right. And uh, uh, Representative Autry and myself have both been elected officials. He's still in office. And you know how important it is when people actually call because it does take time. And uh, it's, you know, it's too easy to send an email and you get thousands of those. But phone calls are really not, uh, they're, they're more rare. And so people do remember them. And it, it makes a huge difference when you're floating the phone lines. Uh, so everybody on the call uh, nationally uh, needs, to, uh, needs to support that. Um, it is such a you know, one more issue that's the intersection of health and a pandemic and climate, because water is a basic human right. It's an essential human right, and it is challenged. It will be challenged going forward by climate impacts, uh, whether it's drought, severe weather, uh, sea level rise, uh, with salt water intruding into our fresh water. Uh, there are so many areas that, that challenge our water, and the idea of shutting off water um, I remember when I had infants and, you know, when you're looking at uh, keeping your infant clean and, and um, people using formula, et cetera, how can you not have water? And, and you think about all the, the parents, I mean, just in normal times, much less in a pandemic. So thank you so much for your advocacy and uh, I hope those who are listening uh, on Facebook and on, um, on Zoom are going to take some action. So, all right. So uh, we have uh, 14 minutes left. Uh, in our call, and um, I'm going to check in um, with our technology moderator, uh, with uh, Paul Zeiss. We're really thankful. He's got the Build a Movement going. He also knows about activism. And with Joel Siegel, uh, and see if we have any um, pressing questions that we want to present, because you all have been monitoring the chat, and uh, if there's any other uh, issue to bring forward. One thing I do want to say, um, there is a Monday evening call on voting rights. Uh, Harvey Wasserman, who has been leading that, uh, that conversation, wanted me to, to tell everyone the connecting information is in the chat if you're on Zoom, and we'll get that out on Facebook as well. Uh, it has been a terrific collection of people from around the country who are talking about the key states 
absolutely we cannot have a better future we cannot get through a pandemic or through climate without the right people representing us who are listening and who care about everyone not just the top you know a quarter of one percent because that's what it's starting to look like more and more so we need yep. the cavalry ain't coming <laughs> that's right we need to vote thank you representative audrey uh so um joel or paul do we have any burning questions that have been uh, building up in the, the Q&A that, that can be answered by our water specialists and our state representative. Yeah, I do have one question. Um, what happens to all the millions of people in America whose water could get shut off or they could be evicted or their broadband? What, what happens to these people if this bill does not get passed with this provision? How many people are gonna be impacted? How, how immediate? So I can answer that for the water side. So we know that in a typical year, 15 million Americans experience a water shutoff. That's a typical year, 15 million Americans. The average utility shuts off 5% of houses in a typical year. But with record breaking unemployment, we, this is not a typical year. How many people will be impacted, we don't know, but it'll be crushing and it'll be devastating for millions of people across our country. And there's real trauma, there's real trauma when people lose water service and they can't take care of themselves and their families. Thank you, Mary. Um, the second question I see is to Representative John Autry. Hello, my Representative John Autry, um, with your very cool beard. Um, what happens if the state of North Carolina and 50 states do not receive uh, federal subsidies to maintain operations? There, there are Republicans who say they call it a blue state bailout, which I can't understand, but um, what happens to the state of North Carolina in terms of your, your fire workers, police workers, health workers, if you do not get uh, a part of this trillion dollar stimulus? So I can tell you that here in North Carolina, we have a rainy day fund that's about $3 billion. We have a disaster recovery fund that's getting close to $4 billion. And so I would say that if the federal government doesn't come to the rescue, uh, we're not gonna be prepared for hurricane season this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had some horrendous storms over the last six years, and uh, we are still in recovery in some parts from Hurricane Matthew, which was five years ago. So the, and, and to think that, you know, it making recovery from a, such a disaster as a partisan issue is just reprehensible. And I'm sure uh, for the theist among us, uh, there is a special place being prepared in the uh, undesirable uh, outcome in the hereafter for folks who find ways to do this and make it a partisan issue. But to think that uh, a, a state like uh, Connecticut New York, North Carolina, we're donor states. Money that leaves North Carolina and goes to Washington does not all come back to North Carolina. It goes to shore up places like Kentucky, South Carolina, uh, Kansas, you know, and so, you know, that, that I, I, I hope that's just a canard that is designed to uh, speak to certain uh, people's electorate, but uh, the reality of it is that uh, you're talking about a disastrous outcome and how in the world does any sort of a semblance of an economy bounce back if you allow states and local government to go bankrupt? And uh, Brother Paul, if you can take it from here, how, how do people survive on a $1,200 stimulus check who are, are out of a job in North Carolina and across the country when they got to pay their bills, their mortgage, their rent, healthcare bills. Is $1,200 enough or do we need more? A larger stimulus package. We also um, had a question, you know, North Carolina has a number of military bases and uh, uh, we had a question come in, uh, does the presence of military and our military preparedness, does that have any impact on uh, the way our state is responding when it receives them? Representative Autry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I lost you there right at the, in, about at the end of your question there. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, that we receive, um, that we have many military bases. Does that, uh, the presence of the military or the, the advocacy of the military, because they've talked about climate change as a 
as a threat multiplier for, for security. Um, does that presence have any impact on the federal funding that we get? Uh, it, it, see, the, the state money that comes from the Fed, that comes into the coffers of North Carolina, does not go to support those military installations. So they're supported from their own uh, corner of the pot at the federal level. Uh, it doesn't have any effect on whether uh, North Carolina is more prosperous or less prosperous, except for the people who buy property, who spend money, that are stationed at those bases. Okay, I'm you know, sorry, the, the questioner actually added to that and said, um, why is the military not helping get supplies to needed folks and helping uh, distribute food, et cetera? But you're, that's a federal question, so you probably can't. <laughs> I, I can I can help answer that a, a little bit. Um, so the federal funds that are coming through are um, uh, funneling into places that we wouldn't expect for military preparedness. Uh, so for instance, heartbreakingly during this period, the border wall construction has not stopped, by the way. Um, so our federal funding during this period has been going to continuing to militarize our borderlands and keeping children in cages and spreading that disease um, among workers who do not have enough PPE down there and to all the communities in the South. So um, federal dollars are going to spreading the COVID-19 uh, crisis in the borderlands. Um, you know, in terms of where it could be going to, and I, I'll also just, um, just to have a huge, you know, asterisk on, on what Senator Merkley was saying before. There have been billions of dollars, even today, dis discovered in the CARES Act package that goes and bails out fossil fuel companies. So that is also where our tax dollars are going. We have, today, we discovered another $2 billion, um, which ba basically can be leveraged into $10 trillion at this point for the fracking companies and the companies that are absolutely exacerbating our climate crisis. Um, so, so that that is where our federal dollars are going to. It is bailing out corporations and fossil fuel companies. It is not going to the people whose water is being shut off. It's not going to the water utilities who need infrastructure funding. It is not going to like, electricity people who are being shut off. And at the end of the day, um, just you know, I think for electricity, it is absolutely critical that we are getting the funding into Mayor Roberts, as you were saying, the microgrids, the distributed solar systems, the heat extremities right now are making people literally die if they do not have electricity of this upcoming summer. Um, they will not have air conditioning and they will die. So how do we stop shut off in the long run? We're not looking for a Band-Aid solution. Our long-term solution is distributed solar on your rooftop or in your community where you have full power over it. You are not being poisoned from the fracked gas plant in your backyard and you have governance decisions over your electricity and you can control it. You are not relying on Duke Energy on this one. Thank you so much, Jean, for that great summary. And in fact, uh, you know, that whole aspect of local control of people at the local level knowing best how to solve their problems and how to provide their resources. Uh, it's really making a comeback during the pandemic because you look at local food, you look at uh, local things you can bike and walk to as people um, are trying to, you know, distance and just do essential things. Um, that whole sense of what, you know, what is local, that's a bipartisan value, really supporting that. And if we had more of that distributed solar, uh, absolutely, it's resilient. Uh, to climate impacts and it uh, is resilient to the grid failure, um, people working on smart grid technology, et cetera. We need more of that. And uh, those elements are in a green stimulus. I hope that everybody listening will be calling your representatives about supporting a green stimulus because we also have to look at not just how we survive right now, but how do we survive the economic downfall in the future? And do we need a jobs program on energy efficiency, on clean energy, on smart grid updates, um, on building out transit, on all these clean transit, electric transit, so that all these things can help us uh, keep our climate um, you know, healthy. So um, you know, those are all great points and the voting rights, uh, great points as well. Um, we, are, we are approaching the end uh, of our time. We're supposed to finish at 2.15. We appreciate everybody. We still have 75 folks on the Zoom call. We appreciate you hanging in there. I know we have hundreds that are watching on Facebook. It'll be recorded and played later. So people who missed some things can, can listen to the whole broadcast. But I wanna say thank you so much. I wanna get everyone the opportunity for a one minute summation 
uh, of whatever you need to say to make sure all the folks listening can help you get your work done because you're doing tremendous work for all of us now and in the future. We thank you. So uh, I'll start with Representative Autry, your, your final minute closure. <laughs> sure. Uh, I, I, I keep telling folks every opportunity I get that uh, what we're experiencing now is really just a precursor of the climate crisis that is around the corner. So the things that we learn from this experience, we need to be applying and, and, and gaining allies that can see beyond the end of their nose and making sure that we're putting policies and mechanisms in place to deal with that impending crisis that's just around the corner. Thank you. Uh, Jean, you're next. Um, just so we have a big battle ahead of us, everyone, um, for the Senate. Uh, so we just are really asking everyone to please defend the nationwide moratorium, defend the Rewind Act, um, and the, the other critical parts that need to be passed by the Senate. Um, I'll also say that, you know, pandemic is a portal to sea change, and this is something that Arvindati Roy talks a lot about. Um, we have two options in these portals. One is to drag the baggage of injustice with us, into a status quo situation where we ignore the lessons that we learned here. But the other one is that we drop those injustices and we actually walk across a threshold to a far just future. And I think for everyone here, that means that it is access to human rights, to shelter, to food, and to stop the corporatization of those human rights. And I think we can do that together. Thank you, Jean. What a tremendous uh, vision of that portal of sea change. And Mary. Let's hear a last word from you. I'm just going to tell everyone once more, pick up your phone and put in 202-609-9041. Now is the moment to take action. We can do this. We can pass a nationwide utility shutoff moratorium. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks so much. And I want to give a special thanks uh, to the panelists who um, have uh, had to leave and go do work uh, on the House floor and the Senate floor. Um, I also want to thank so much Joel Siegel, former uh, staffer to Representative John Conyers, who has been instrumental in pulling this together, uh, getting folks on board, helping build that national coalition, and Paul Zeitz, who is uh, Build a Movement, who has also done tremendous work, um, well, both of you with Global AIDS and with so many other, and, and John Autry showing off his nice t-shirt, um, so many other needs that we have as a, as a nation and as a globe, because we're all in this together. And so thank you, Paul. Thank you, Joel. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, those who have left. I know that Domingo Garcia was supposed to be with us and was unable to, but we also want to appreciate the League of United Latin American Citizens and all the work that they do because immigrants are also on the front line. They are also uh, suffering, not getting the PPE they need, not getting any benefits, um, many of whom are legal and still not able to get benefits because of quirks in our system. So um, even ones who don't have those paper documents absolutely are humans and have human rights and are here in our country doing work and they should be protected too. So I um, just want to say thank you once again. Uh, we're going to sign off and uh, we will be doing more of these with the great magic of Paul and Joel and, and hopefully with Jennifer Roberts again too. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer Roberts. Thank you, Mayor Jennifer Roberts. Great job. Thank you, Mayor Roberts. Thank you, thank you everyone. Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, all the speakers. Take care, everybody. Safe. Have a great weekend. Have a good weekend. Get some rest. Especially you, Jean. Get some rest. You work all the, you work all the time. <laughs> okay, signing off now. Peace, Thanks. everyone. Have a good weekend. Thanks again. Have a good weekend. <laughs> bye bye.